where is the central controller of all these hormones? And In what the is brain. the mechanism? Very good. So the central control the for majority of these hormones is in the brain. And can anyone tell me the mechanism of control? How are these hormones being maintained in narrow intervals? I'm looking for two words. Oh, is it the feedback loop, sir? Good. Specifically, is it positive or negative feedback? You'd be very specific. Lauren, do you want to take it away? Positive or negative feedback? Uh, I'm thinking negative. Yeah, negative feedback makes sense. When there's too much of a hormone, there's going to be increased negative feedback telling that structure or gland to release less hormone. And just to preface this, everyone, glands are just structures or organs that release hormones. So here you have your thyroid gland, you have your adrenal glands, this little cool looking hat sitting on top of your kidneys. Right? Every time you've gone on a roller coaster, every time you've uh, you know, had a huge scare in your life these glands suddenly release adrenaline. So that's where adrenaline comes from, the fight or flight. Before you sit your HC exams, this hormone's gonna be in overdrive, right? So yeah, all part of normal physiology. Good. So the two words I wanna hear for hormonal control is negative feedback, and specifically not just the brain, I want you to mention the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Hypothalamic pituitary. If you look here, what you see here, imagine a samurai sword sliced straight through the center of someone's brain, and you're seeing the side view of that brain now, right? So it's perfectly cut at the center, and right at the center, right here, right, you have your hypothalamus. And directly below that, you have this little sac-like structure known as your pituitary. Now, we're going to focus on reproductive control, because this is very important for controlling menstruation, this is very important for ovulation and for life to propagate. OK, so the body has really great ways of internally timing everything. So, Georgina, any idea what hormone the hypothalamus releases to control all of these hormones in pregnancy? Um, isn't it the. Oh. You need to tell me the full name, just the letters. Can anyone tell me? Lookman? Uh, FSH and LH. Very close, Lookman. It's GnRH for the hypothalamus. Okay, GnRH or gonadotropin releasing hormone. Now remember, I told you this. You don't need to know its full name. You just need to know it's GnRH, and it's going to act on the pituitary gland. For those of you who want to know a lot of detail, the pituitary is two lobes. Looks like this, and we act on the anterior or front of the pituitary. You would see that in some of your textbooks. You don't need to go into that much detail in your exams, but hopefully now you know there are two lobes to the pituitary. So if you ever hear the word anterior pituitary, they're talking about the front. So this GnRH is going to travel straight down. It's not going to travel in the bloodstream per se. It will travel straight down in the brain itself to the pituitary gland. And it's going to stimulate the release of hormones. Now, does anyone know the name of the hormones? GnRH is going to stimulate. So Lookman said it. Rhea? LH. Yes, LH and FSH, right? They're your gonadotropins. What does gonadotropin mean? You all have to think and not memorize here. Because the second you start memorizing biology or medicine, it becomes infinitely impossible. What does the word gonadotropin tell you? It's telling you something. Are they the hormones that act on the gonads? Perfect, right? So now you know, you don't even have to memorize anymore. If you remember GnRH, you can remember everything else. GnRH is going to stimulate gonadotropins from the pituitary, and gonadotropins are going to do what gonadotropins do. They're going to travel and act on the gonads. In this case, we're talking about the female reproductive system. So they're going to act on the ovaries. And uh, quite an interesting point, just so you'll understand the basis behind things. The testes and the ovaries, once upon a time, for all of us, were the exact same structure. We were all in uterus by default female. And it's actually the Y chromosome in males that activates in the middle of gestation, and it starts making proteins that differentiate the female reproductive tract into the male reproductive tract. So the testes are literally the male ovary. They just descend down into the scrotal sac by birth, okay? 
So I guess you can all think about this now. In the male reproductive system, what structure is releasing all of the hormones, the testosterone, etc.? We don't have ovaries, so what structure would it be? Harsha? In the male reproductive system, what structure is releasing all the hormones, the testosterone, the estrogen, the progesterone? Is it your testicles? Yeah, it's the testes. Very good. Right. And I guess implication of this is if an old man comes with enlarged testes and they're altered hormones, what should the doctor be thinking? Testicular mass, raised hormones. This is why you're learning all of this to make implications. What would you be thinking? Testicular cancer. And it's not just the old. There are teenagers or 20 year olds who get testicular cancer. It's, it's actually one of the more common cancers in young people, right? Good. Anyway, we'll come back to this. So GnRH is going to stimulate the gonadotropins, LH and FSH. Now, they have a long transit to make. You'll see the distance we need to cover here. So who can tell me what highway they traveled through to reach the gonads? Anyone? Kirthana, what highway have I drawn for you? So perfectly in red. This is your bloodstream. Okay. As make sure if I do ask you a question, you either message it in the okay, thank you. Perfect. So yeah, so message in the chat or let me know uh, as soon as you can. I don't care whether you get the answer correct or wrong. I care if you give it an effort. Okay, does anyone know the specific blood vessel that's traveling down the bloodstream? I'll give you a little practical exercise because this isn't magical stuff you're learning. It's right inside you right now. For those of you who are relatively leaner or skinnier, if you get your hands and you go straight to the center of your tummy, go slightly to the left and you press really hard down, don't press too hard that you perforate something, but you will feel something pulsating back at you. Does anyone feel that? It's a practical experiment, so you don't forget what the structure is. That's my heart. Yeah, so some of you would feel it, and that's your aorta, right? So every time your heart is beating, the force of that beat is pushing blood at such a high pressure that vessel would just completely bulges out back at you. So that's happening about 60 to 100 times a minute. This is your aorta. And that's usually the main artery that delivers blood all over the body. So if there's one blood vessel you should generally know of, it's your aorta. Okay, good. So all those hormones will travel down in the bloodstream. Eventually, they will reach the ovary. When they reach the ovary, what hormones will be released? These are the highest yield hormones that you need to know, everyone. They're not going to ask you about GnRH much. In fact, if you can identify GnRH, done. Move on. It's estrogen and progesterone that we care about a lot. So we start releasing estrogen and progesterone. What does estrogen do? Lookman? Um, <clears throat> estrogen uh, stimulates the growth of the endometrium. Very good, right? So what estrogen is going to do? We have to think about this. I want you all to not just memorize, but understand. So, Lookman, do you know why estrogen is trying to do that? Uh, yeah, because it's uh, preparing for implantation. Very good, right? So, estrogen is being released from follicles in the ovary. Specifically, the follicles look like this, right? In the center of the follicle, you have your ova. And then it's these outer cells of the follicle that are the hormonally active cells. They're the hormone factory. They're going to release the estrogen. And after the ova comes out, they start to also release progesterone. So what happens here is you start releasing estrogen because the body is preparing for ovulation to occur. Okay. And after ovulation, it's preparing for that ova to be fertilized and that fertilized over to travel down an implant. And so by the time it implants, it has a rich source of glucose, nutrients, blood supply, so that it can grow from a couple of cells into a completely new life form, a fetus, right? Good, good job. Now, what happens later is another hormone. So as soon as the ova 
get ovulated, and we'll talk about time points a bit later. As soon as the ova are ovulated, we make estrogen, but we also start making another hormone. Can anyone tell me what that hormone is? What is the second hormone that we release? Progest progesterone. Progesterone. Yeah. yeah, this is what all teenagers would probably hate. It's their progesterone that causes hair production, that causes acne, oily skin production, all of those teenager or hormonal effects are mediated by progesterone. It's an interesting fact. In contraceptive pills, if you take the progesterone out, you reduce those side effects. But then again, what is estrogen doing, everyone? It's replicating cells in the endometrium. Does anyone know what the concern would be from a medical point of view? For anything that makes cells divide too much, such as endometrial cells. Cancel. Very good. I like it. See, this is why you're all learning biology, not just to memorize, regurgitate in, in paper in the HSC. It's to draw implications to real life, right? So estrogen only contraceptives increase your risk of uh, cancers of the lining of the uterus, very minorly, but they do. And also of the breast as well, as it grows with estrogen too. Good, so that's what those hormones are doing. So the progesterone specifically, apart from those bad effects, because you don't need to mention those in your exam, what is progesterone trying to do here? So we said estrogen is going to increase or grow the endometrium, right? So results in growth, of the endometrium. That's what you need to say in your exams. And when we say growth, this is going to be increased cells, increased glucose. And the reason it's doing that is to prepare for implantation. What is a progesterone for? Anyone? Um, progesterone uh, maintains the endometrium and prevents it from uh, con contracting. Yeah, very good. So, okay, very important point here. The endometrium, everyone, you would have learned this. Uh, I'm going to ask Rhea this. Rhea, what are the cell types in the, in the human body? Go back to your 11 and tell me that. Prokaryotic and eukaryotic. Yeah, but do, how about like, I'll give you an example. Epithelial cells is one cell type. What are the other cell types? Oh, we had connective. Um, muscle and think about it. Um, neurons, neurotransmitters. Connect. No, no, no. I said that already. Nervous tissue. So that's nervous, the right. One. Very good. Right. So connective muscle, epithelial, nervous. Only muscle tissue can contract. Everyone. So your epithelial cells, your endometrium cannot contract. So progesterone, what it does, is. Look, you can technically say it grows endometrium as well, but to be very specific, it maintains the growth that estrogen in short. So it maintains the endometrial lining. Okay, so estrogen grows the endometrium. Progesterone will maintain the endometrium. Okay, so keep it enlarged, thick, filled with glucose and nutrients. But progesterone acts in this layer here. What do you think this layer is composed of? So Rhea's given us the cell types. We had epithelial cells, which is what the endometrium is. Those are lining cells. Touch your skin right now. That's all epithelial cells reinforced in keratin armor. What is that cell that would be sitting here? Think about it. Bulky, it's pink. What should it be? Muscle cells. Yeah, so there's a muscle cell. So that's called the myometrium to be specific. But what progesterone does is it prevents the muscle layer from contracting. So all you need to say is it prevents uterine contractions, reduces uterine contractions. Can anyone tell me why the uterus should not contract over the next nine months? And it should logically make sense to all of you. Lukman, any ideas? Doesn't it kind of constrict space for the baby? Um, oh, sorry, my mic was on mute. <laughs> yeah, so um, space for the baby. Okay, let's think about this. Uh, one of the biggest misconceptions that we have is that the baby or the fetus is here. That is actually not the case, right? And I, I thought that until we learned about reproduction. What actually happens, everyone, is 
<laughs> Apologies. So what happens is the the embryo will implant into the wall of the uterus like this, okay? And then it will be surrounded like this, okay? And it will grow out of the wall. That is what is going to happen. So eventually what will happen is you will have this sac that grows out of the wall. And that's going to be called your amniotic sac. And inside is going to be all the amniotic fluid. And then you have your fetus. Right? Typically, its head should be down, head should not be up, because babies come head out first. And that's very important. Otherwise, you can get a complicated pregnancy. Good. So if you can imagine, what would happen if you contracted the walls of the uterus together at that point? You would either get a miscarriage, a stillbirth, or premature delivery. And you don't want any of those things. To the point where if this happens before 36 weeks, we will start to give medications like like a progesterone to prevent uterine contractions. So that's the basis. So I'd say the most important function of progesterone is point two. So if you don't mention it, you'll likely lose marks.